Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings together prominent New Yorkers with the faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. If you believe recent polls, it's a good time to be a Democrat. If you believe recent history, you don't believe the polls. Democrats who have repeatedly in recent years snatched defeat from the jaws of victory appear poised for a historic victory both in Washington and Albany. To some degree, it's a, it is a, it is a it is a cyclical phenomenon, echoing the Democrats' collapse in 1994 that saw, that saw the Republicans seize control of both houses of Congress for the first time since the years after World War II. In Albany, Republican hopes appear to be limited to holding on to, the, to a majority in the state Senate, as all, as all three statewide offices are headed for Democratic hands, although Comptroller Alan Hevesy's self-inflicted legal problems could change that situation. While the increasingly unpopular war in Iraq has saddled Republicans with an increasingly unpopular president, politics is also offering up its usual combination of serious scandals and farce. In Washington, the Internet antics of former Congressman Mark Foley with underage congressional pages have exposed the Republican leadership more attuned to, to proclaiming family values than, and, than enforcing them. And in New York, we have the tawdry, and I must admit entertaining, soap opera concerning former Westchester District Attorney Janine Pirro's taped telephone appeal to disgraced former police commissioner Bernie Carrick to, to bug her husband's boat to see if he was having an affair with the wife of the lawyer who defended him in the federal tax fraud trial that sent him to jail. You can't make this stuff up. We are, we are joined today by four, by four journalists who follow and report on politics here in the city to discuss all of this and whatever else is on their minds. Era Lewis is a columnist for the New York Daily News. Herson Barrero is a columnist for El Diario La Prensa. Maggie Haberman is a political reporter for the New York Post. And Tom Robbins reports for the Village Voice. Let me start with, with you, Errol. Um, are, we, are we over, are the Democrats overconfident about a sweep? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you go back to right up to Election Day, remember, in 2004, people were already measuring the drapes for John Kerry in the White House, and it was all over by the, the next morning. Uh, a lot of the polls, you have to really sort of be careful because you'll see polls that say uh, a generic Democrat or a generic voter uh, trusts Democrats more than Republicans. Well, that doesn't translate into getting control of the House of Representatives. You've got to look race by race at what's going on in upstate New York, what's going on in Connecticut, suburbs of Pennsylvania, eastern Iowa. There's a seat in Kentucky that's up for grabs. Uh, there's all kinds of different factors that are strictly local that really have to be looked at. Um, I think likewise, really, for, for New York State, I think the Democrats are confident with a great deal of reason, but I think what we're going to see when you have all of the top offices held by Democrats, which is not just possible but likely, and this would be the first time it happened in probably over 50 years, um, we're going to see things that we haven't seen in a while, which is Democrats really fighting hard against each other in these vicious kind of internal feuds that can paralyze government just as effectively as a Democrat-Republican split. It's good for, it's, uh, good for reporters, though. Well, it, it creates a little work for us. I mean, you have to actually understand the personalities. It's not just party ideology that's, that's uh, dividing people. Herson, um, as the second columnist on the panel, uh, in watching the elections, at least on a national level, it seems as if the general theory is throw the bums out. Um, the Democrats haven't really put forth any ideas. I mean, it's throw them out. I have a banner that says exactly that, throw them all out. I mean, I would take the whole lot of them. If you ever think about this, right here in the studio audience but at home, Look at the city council level. Let's not even go to Washington. How many people do we elect? You elect a city council member, you elect the public advocate, a, a city controller, you elect the, uh, the mayor. Then you go on to the state legislature, a, a senator, an assembly person, you go on to a governor, a controller, an attorney general, and then you elect also a congressperson. Now, do we need all these public officials picking our pockets and not counting the president? I mean, who needs them, whether they're Republican or president? Do you feel represented? I mean, I ask all of you, do you really feel represented? Do you feel like they're doing anything for you? Do you feel getting your money's worth? I say no. I say just, what about the borough presidents? Do they, have you, what was the last time you saw your borough president? I mean, it's ridiculous. So it doesn't matter if it's Republican. You know, they're talking about right now Alan Hevesy getting the hell out of Albany before he's arrested or indicted or whatever he's going to be. But, you know, it, it, it's Alan today, so it's a Republican in Washington. Does it make a difference? The republic is in trouble. I think if the Founding Fathers actually took a look at the Constitution, which is one of the most perfect documents that we've managed to screw up, I mean, through generations, what do we have in this nation? 
civil rights, civil liberties being lost constantly, and we're worried about who the hell is going to command the House or the Senate? Who cares anymore? It doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican. By the way, I'm an independent. I do vote. I'm not a communist, I believe. The only Marx that I believe is Groucho Marx, who said it all. You know, when, you, when you're a Democrat, when you're poor, when you're Republican, when you're money, well, that's changed. That doesn't, it doesn't hold true to anybody. Where is the person... The average person being represented nowadays. So I, to me, I don't care who's there. They're all crooks and thieves. They're all pedophiles in some way or <laughs> some way or shape. They all betray the public trust. Don't be bashful. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna hold back. Um, uh, Tom, uh, <laughs> following up on that, I second that emotion. <laughs> An easy um, act to follow. You've been looking at a lot of um, uh, at a lot of these political races. Um, do you agree that it's more throw the bum out? I mean, is there is there? I, I agree. There with, I agree with Herson's enthusiasm, and, and I, I disagree with the specifics. I mean, I, I look. I, I think it does matter. I think it matters a whole lot. I think that uh, whether or not we find that elected officials end up disappointing us, as, as many of them do, they do make the decisions that determine everyday life for a lot of us. And I, when I look at elections, I look at not just who those people in office are going to be, but who they're going to appoint, and who the people are who are going to be the judges that they're going to put in office. These things count. They count for big people and they count for little people. And this time in Washington, I think we are looking at a sea change. I mean, I do believe that on the one hand that Errol's correct that there are a series of individual races that need to be looked at closely. But I also think we are talking about an enormous change that's taking place, which is different than has happened even during the Clinton years. I think we're talking about a rollback of an overall conservative viewpoint, one that said neoconservative, conservative ideas are the ones that have the answers. I think that people have decided, you know, maybe we weren't too smart to follow that idea. And I think they're looking at something else. The Democrats haven't provided it yet, but I think that people are looking for it. I think that's a hopeful sign. Um, the 2008 presidential election could be between a whole bunch of New Yorkers. Could be, could it uh, could involve Hillary Clinton. It could involve Rudy Giuliani. It could involve George Pataki. It could involve Mike Bloomberg. Uh, you know, I've always worked on the theory that politics has no beginnings and ends. It's all middles. And people, even before this election, are looking ahead. Um, are there broader, are there broader stakes in this election? Sure. I mean, especially one of the names that, that you listed, certainly Hillary Clinton, who was the only person in that field of four who I would actually bank money on, on really running at this point. Uh, you know, I think that George Pataki is smart to stay in it. Looking at this field uh, where the conservatives are, are cratering, you know, George Allen, et cetera, Bill Frist, uh, there is no reason for him to not stay in it. There aren't too many uh, alternatives to him. Uh, and he does have money and he has the ability to fundraise. Um, there's large implications, certainly for Hillary Clinton on, let's say, if the Democrats do take control of the House and Nancy Pelosi becomes the Speaker. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is fairly liberal. That's not necessarily great for Hillary Clinton going forwards for her presidential ambitions. Um, in terms of Mike Bloomberg, uh, I think that if Mike Bloomberg, if we're going to buy the logic that he's going to run as an independent, then I'm not I think sure. That, right. Yeah, then then or, or run at all, then I, you know, then, then the more chaos, the better. I am not among those who subscribe to the belief that he will run, but he. You know, certainly, I think we'll keep this up for as long as he can. There's no downside, and when you can self-finance, there's really no downside. And right now, everybody in the country is returning his calls and and Kevin Sheeky's calls, um, his uh, his top deputy uh, and Rudy Giuliani. Um, you know, it's uh, it's not great for him if the Democrats take control of Congress. Uh, you know, this has been he's been one of the people out there banging the drum as a as a fundraiser and as a as a shockingly as a party standard bearer um, and, a, and a huge celeb name um, in all of these races across the country. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the argument for him would be that it shows the country is moving more toward the center and that would be more appealing for someone who is a social moderate. Um, I, after seeing him in New Hampshire recently, I, I'm not sure when we will be seeing him actually on the campaign trail. But, that's you know, just, but that's just me. We're obsessed with New York, uh, with New York, because we're New Yorkers and we're the most parochial people in the world. But even if you look Don't know what you're across about. the, uh, you know, uh, you know, into into Jersey and into Connecticut, you have very different close races. I think Bob Menendez in New Jersey is in a lot of trouble, even if the polls show Tom Kane. And you have the 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 phenomenon of Joe Lieberman, um, who seems, who says he, you know, who is running now as an independent after getting defeated in the. You know, in the uh, Democratic primary, are those more reflective of what's going on in the country? Well, I, I think they're they're more reflective of some of the splits of the Democratic Party. I mean, you've got corruption issues in some local parties, and that's what Bob Menendez is dealing with. Um, you've got a really strong anti-war thrust uh, among many 
uh, members of the Democratic base, and that's what almost unseated Lieberman. He seems to be doing better in the polls. There are some other nearby states that are also worth looking at, like Pennsylvania, where there's this huge fight that's been going on to try and unseat uh, Rick Santorum, and it looks like it's going to be successful that the Democrats will. He's one of the most right wing senators. Mm -hmm. And this is country. to get Democratic control of the United States Senate. They need six seats, and you know they're pretty close. They're almost, they're, you know, they're halfway there right off the bat. It's anticipated, if you believe the polls at all, that the the Democrats will win Ohio, that they'll win Pennsylvania, that they'll win Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and then after that you've got Montana, you've got Missouri, you've got uh, Virginia, and you've got Tennessee. And you know, even Harold Ford, a black Democrat running in Tennessee. Um, you know, where the Ku Klux Klan got its origin, you know, a very conservative state for 100 years now. Um, he's leading in the polls. Uh, he was supposed to crater at some point. The, 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 the gap was supposed to widen. The gap hasn't widened. He's been ahead, and he's had this narrow lead that he's hung on to. I've talked to Republican strategists who say they think he can pull it out. So um, I think what the Democratic Party means, he's about as different from Hillary Clinton as you could possibly get, although she's been fundraising for him and supporting him. Mm -hmm. Very conservative, very moderate Democrat uh, is Harold Ford. So. We're going to see this tussle over the war, over the economy. You know, I mean, I would have to disagree with, with you, uh, Harrison, on, uh, on, on whether it makes a difference. I mean, the Democrats have said they're going to raise the minimum wage. For millions and millions of Americans, it makes a huge difference whether you're making five fifteen an hour or six fifteen or seven fifteen or $8 an hour, you know. And, um, you know, the Democrats have done, I think, a pretty good job of keeping the focus on the Republicans, but also sort of saying, look, if you want some of these things, if you want... Uh, the, the minimum wage debate to move forward at all. I mean, its purchasing power is at an all-time low at, at this point because it hasn't adjusted for inflation. Vote Democrat. And, you know, the, the, the three things that I think are, are really sort of pushing people towards the Democrats' voters, casualties in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I, the way I think of it is I, I call mm -hmm. it casualties, mm -hmm. Katrina, and corruption. You know, and, and what that brings home for people is a major American city was lost on the watch of mm -hmm. this White House. I mean, just gone. New Orleans, gone. Mm -hmm. um, Fewer than half of the residents have returned. I mean, a complete mess down there. Um, the, the casualties in Iraq at an all-time high for this month, or the f highest in several years. Um, this question of competence. Can these folks run the republic? I think that's going to kind of get everybody in. But then, right behind that, <laughs> you'll have to answer this question. Um, is a Democrat from Ohio or from Pennsylvania mm -hmm. or Hillary Clinton or anybody else have they got better answers on how to rebuild a major American city, how to get out of the, the quagmire in the Middle East and so forth? Well, before you jump in, Maggie, I just got to say that look how different they are, Democrats and Republicans. It, you know, we're talking about a wall now to keep those lousy people from Mexico and, and from Central America coming over to work for slave wages and be exploited because they love it here. They just love to be exploited and abused. But it was, and we're talking about a Republican, we're talking about George Walker Bush, the, the most dangerous person on this planet. <laughs> Bushito is the most dangerous person on this planet. So that Osama bin Laden, he's got the weapons. Who's got the weapons here? It's George Bush. It isn't that lunatic from North Korea. We're the most powerful nation and we have a loony in the White House. Now, let me just point out to you, just remind you, it was under a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, Mr. All Savior of the masses. He enacted the North American Free Trade Agreement, the most exploited action that this government has taken in the last 12 years, going on 13. If you go back, Errol, and examine what that's done to Mexico, this was, this was supposed to be an ideal situation between Canada and the United States to go save our neighbor. And what's happened? Labor. Labor, the people that support all of this, with President Bill Clinton, that, that bastion of liberalism and of caring for the world, that compassionate human Democrat. What happened? You know what the, what the average wage was in Mexico 12 years ago? Before he signed it, $5, five American dollars per day. You know what it is today? Less than four. This is the compassionate Democrat. He's a scoundrel, just like the one we have right now. They could care less. And then they want to build a wall Okay, that's supposed to be 2,000 miles, but it's only now, what is it, 700? With billions of dollars spent, the ones that were abusing the Iraqi people, assassinating people, something we should have, Democrats who were, I mean, they, sh they just voted along. Not only would it invading a country that had nothing to do with the terrorist attack we got here, that other thug is in some camel's ass. Osama bin Laden, where is he hiding? And we're talking, what's the difference between these people? I mean, come in Bosnia, you know what Bill Clinton did in Bosnia? Look at the Richard Clark book. He had people shot. He gave the military orders to people shot. These are the good guys? First of all, um, 
this idea of Hillary as a, you know, and Bill as these great liberals, I think, has always been one of the, uh, I mean, she certainly doesn't proclaim herself to be a, um, a liberal. Certainly not right now. She used the word progressive once during the Democratic primary in a little seen piece of direct mail sent to voters. Um, Why is that? Well, because that's not really how you win nationally, um, as we all know. Uh, so, you know, being being uh, being described as a liberal has not been positive. Liberals have not fared very well. Look, just you know, uh, see how see Dean Howard. You know, um, the the thing that I was going to say in response to what what Errol was saying, which was is a completely uh, unrelated and nowhere near as important point as what you were making, which was actually uh, about policy versus politics. But uh, one of the races that that Errol cited, Lamont Lieberman. I mean, that is a race that was that was fought in Connecticut. In right. Connecticut, is, is being argued solely about the war because Ned Lamont has never been able to expand his candidacy. But actually, there are issues that people, a lot of Democratic voters, are upset with the Bush administration about that had uh, that Lieberman did vote along with with the Bush administration. That had Lamont, I think, pushed those harder, like Social Security, et cetera, those are issues that I think would have narrowed the gap. So these really races are are very are very local. Um, it, it isn't all about Iraq. A lot of it is coming down to pocketbook issues. A lot of it is coming back to county property tax issues for, you know, current office holders running for congressional seats, for instance. Um, you know, you look at the, the congressional races going on in upstate New York, which are insane. I mean, they're exploding. You've got Tom Reynolds, who's hanging onto his seat against Jack Davis, who, who even Democrats don't necessarily want to be around a lot. He's, he's often described as sort of an off-kilter candidate. Well, he was um, a Republican until last year. Among, right. among other right. things. Well, right. we have a mayor who was a right. Democrat until he ran, so um, <laughs> that's not necessarily a disqualifier. But, uh, you know, I, you, you've got the, the uh, John Sweeney, uh, uh, Kristen Gillibrand race, which is, has been insane. Uh, our Curry uh, Meyer, there was a, a, a contentious, sexually charged ad that TV stations refused to air, uh, and that now seems to be swinging toward our Curry. So uh, it, it's all... It's there. There are. It's hard to make broad brush generalizations. It is all taking place front by front. Except that, in in those races, I mean, Tom Reynolds, who is the head of the Congressional mm -hmm. Campaign Committee for the Republicans, is a congressman from Buffalo, mm -hmm. second or third most powerful guy in. Yeah, it was in, just testifying in the, in the Foley House. scandal. Sure, he got hit by the by That's the right. kind of backwash of the Foley scandal because he supposedly had suspicions or was told that Foley had behaved inappropriately. And he says, well, I told Hastert, and that's all mm -hmm. I had to do. You know, there's this, I mean, it almost seems as if this was a kind of, kind of a breaking point that the kind of hypocrisy issue moved to the, moved to the forefront. That, you know, I, I think I said in my opening that they proclaim family values, but they don't, and, but they don't enforce them. Well, and the hypocrisy is often a bigger sin than any kind of crime you can, that, that you can commit. I mean, whatever, what, it was, what was happening with the Iraq war right before the Foley scandal broke is that actually the president's numbers, if you, if you look back, were starting to rebound. Um, things, Despite the Bob Woodward book, which has some very damaging claims about the Bush administration in it, uh, it is people like us who are reading that book. It is very hard mm -hmm. to translate it to a news story. It is not. It was not going to get out there except for uh, in, in very specific cable news shows day to day. It wasn't going to have the sweeping... Uh, cover of every paper, editorialized for days. Um, the Foley scandal is simple. It is a sex scandal. It is easy for people to understand. It involves uh, something that you know suburban mothers are very afraid of. It turned off the conservative base hugely for a variety of issues. So it was, you know, some some Democrats have argued, oh, this is a shame because it got us off the war. Well, the, I'll and, tell you, the, the, the other ready-made issue that Democrats have been running on, if you look at the states where they're, they're winning narrow races and chipping away at the Republican or about to chip away at the Republican majority in the, in the U.S. Senate, it's places like Ohio, places like Pennsylvania. These are states that have had uh, tens of thousands of people laid off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I looked at the mass layoff upstate, statistics. Upstate New York. Upstate New York. Sure. New York is in the top five. The top five states for, for layoffs uh, right now are California, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, and New York uh, are, are in the top four, and and uh, and Ohio's in in there as well. So, and we're talking about big big numbers. I mean, over fifty one thousand people laid off in Ohio this year That's alone. Astonishing. That is not a way if you are a Republican uh, incumbent mm -hmm. senator or uh, mm -hmm. an outgoing governor who's got his own scandals out in Ohio. <laughs> That's not a way to convince voters that this is the party to stay with. This is the team that's, right. that's gonna, gonna gonna take us over. I think that accounts more than anything for the crumbling numbers in Ohio and in Pennsylvania. I think that more than anything accounts for the the, the sweeping change we're about to see here in New York. I mean, if you 
uh, see over 50,000 people laid off, and that's what it's been in, up, in, in New York, almost all of it upstate. Um, are you going to take a chance on another, you know, on a, an extension of the Pataki administration? There's no reason to. I mean, you know, to, to hear Faso say pretty much what Pataki said t over 10 years ago, all you have to do is cut the taxes and cut the regulation and business will take care of us. And well, they've been hearing it for 12 years. It hasn't worked. You know, and, and uh, if it was working, you wouldn't have laid off uh, 50,000 plus people this year. But who do you trust then? Do you trust Hillary who promised 200,000 jobs for upstate New York? That she's gonna, what is she going to do? And now she says she blames Bush for this? And then she says, I'm waiting for a, for a Democratic governor? I mean, come on, has Elliot spoken about, uh, maybe I missed something. And by the way, I'm voting for Elliot Spitzer. He's the only Democrat that I'm going to vote for. I'm an independent, registered independent. I'm not voting for any other Democrat. I think Elliot has earned the vote of many people. You're voting as for Jeanine Pirro? No, I'm not voting for Jeanine Pirro, but I'm not, I'm not voting for Andrew Cuomo either. I I'm going to fight for an alternative because I don't believe that, I'm, I'm really disturbed by what the report that Wayne had. I mean, and I like Andrew on a personal level, but I won't vote for him or Jeanine Pirro. I think we deserve better. Look, but I'm the kind of guy who voted for Ralph Nader in 2000 and 2004. Watch, watch it, don't throw. But, you know, because I really don't, I believe I have respect for myself and my vote. And it doesn't matter where it goes. It's not going to go to one of these scoundrels. I can't get myself, I mean, I'm going to vote for Alan Hevesy or that low, the loony who's actually calling him on this time. They actually, I can't vote for that guy either, so I'll find If there's a third party candidate, I'll vote for them. I will participate in the electoral process, but I really in good conscience kept, I can't vote for Hillary Rodham Clinton. She supports a war. Why doesn't she send Chelsea? If you believe in a war, send your child. That's the first thing you do. What George Bush should have done with his two twins. John McCain certainly has two of his sons in there. I, I got to have respect. I don't agree with John McCain. But if you have your kids in there, it's your blood in there, then I have respect for you. If you spent five years in a, con in a camp in a prison, as a prisoner of war, I have respect for you. You can tell me something about war. You can probably ask me to send my child out there. But Hillary Rodham Clinton and Bill Clinton are going to ask me? He was smoking weed while he avoided the draft? Come on, get the hell out of here. Who's going to respect these people? Tom, um, with all the... <laughs> well, what can I say? We've had a bunch of corruption scandals that largely are Republicans. See, Bob doesn't like the weed thing. Uh, he didn't inhale. He didn't inhale. From what if I, if I if I remember the Marsha Kramer show, uh, um, and we have uh, we have a bunch of we have a bunch of Republican corruption scandals in Washington. We've had a good series of Democratic corruption scandals. I'm talking about Brian McLaughlin, what's going on in Brooklyn, with the whole you know. Locally, Democrats have been no slouch when it comes to corruption. Uh, we, we <laughs> definitely, they've definitely held up their end of the bargain. Uh, it, it hasn't extended to the arena on a national level that uh, that Republicans managed to step in, in a very timely way right before these elections. But you know, on a on a local level, clearly, uh, as, as far as the the legislature goes, it, it is it has been an astonishing parade of people. I, I think that. The, the charges against Brian McLaughlin, the former assemblyman from Queens and the uh, president of the Central nation's labor largest county. labor organization here in New York were absolutely astonishing. I mean, the level of thievery that was going on alleged against him, uh, everything from uh, uh, taking from an organization that he set up that I reported on when I was at the Daily News uh, quite optimistically to help immigrants in New York and taking every single dollar allegedly from the salary of the person he appointed to run it, it was just it was just mind-boggling. I, mean, I had reported something about that allegedly. scandal because I had learned something from uh, from people who were working on it, but I hadn't learned that detail. And and that one I, I thought was you know the little league thing everyone picked up on because that sort of like took your breath away as well. But but there there is something in politics, and 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 Herson was alluding it to it before, which really does escape people. I mean we've we've seen it a lot in Brooklyn with the Clarence Norman series of scandals. There, there has been a level at which people have somehow reached an arrogance of power, and, and it has been unreachable. I, I don't think that it is a partisan one. I do think that it is on both sides. We saw Guy Valella in the Republican side mm -hmm. in the Bronx mm -hmm. come down on, uh, on similar charges uh, a couple of years ago. But it is something, if ever we did have a governor who was going to try to grapple with that, you, you would hope that it would be Elliot Spitzer, simply because he does come from a law enforcement background. I haven't heard him talk enough about it. I would like to hear him talk more about that in the campaign as we get on, since he is going to walk right in, apparently, to the executive mansion. Let, let's, let's hear him really talk about what moves he would take. And there would be an issue right there, front and center, he could talk about, which is his running mate, Alan Hevesy. He could well, he, address he, himself yeah. to that right now. He took, well, he took a sort of... 
non-position on it today, saying that he, uh, you know, he was going to reevaluate his endorsement of Alan Hevesy, which I suspect, if the re at the end of the reevaluation, it's uh, I'm backing him again, seems unlikely. So, uh, but yeah, it was it was not exactly the the strong words that lots of people were hoping. How much of this? Out. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a, I've always been suspicious of one-party rule. I think what's going on in Washington with the Republicans in control of everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has been Absolutely. has exacerbated the destructiveness of the government towards normal, you know, average people. And you know, when I grew up, um, you know, Rockefeller was governor, and you had Arthur Levitt was the Democratic mm -hmm. controller. Then you had. Mario Cuomo come in and you had Ned Regan was mm -hmm. the Republican controller, somebody to keep an eye on him. Now you have the Republicans in there and you have Alan Hevesy who's there to keep an eye on him as the Democratic controller. We're looking at one party rule in, um, you know, in Albany. Now I may be, you know, I may prefer if I'm going to have one party rule, I may prefer to be Democrats and be Republicans, but the idea of one party rule is something that voters in this state traditionally have not liked. I would no, just, no, I would just remind you real quick that like Democrats are real capable of splintering into many different parties once they're in well, power. Well, so are the Republicans. And I, and right I think now. we're looking so at are the, that. So right? are the Republicans. I mean, the Republicans are turning on each other as well. So I mean, but but what about I mean? No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the the, the scandal that has uh, enmeshed uh, uh, Alan Hevesy was brought about only because he had a Republican opponent. A Republican mm. opponent mm -hmm. who, against s almost $6 million that Hevesy has in the bank for his campaign, has only a little over $40,000. And he yes. made a phone call. Yes. He's got millions, on a bluff, of, uh, millions of free media right now. Well, he, he, made, he made a phone call to Hevesy's you know, anti-waste and abuse line and said, I hear that there's this guy called the mm -hmm. controller who, who has a chauffeur that he's not supposed to be using for, for personal purposes. And that was how, if, if it weren't for that uh, hopeless allegedly hopeless candidacy, we never would have found out about this. It's the best possible argument for, uh, for, for contested elections, for people, even if they're long shots, being in the race. It's the best argument for debates. It's the best argument for having some kind of check and balance because that's the way our system is set up. Well, I think you can make the argument that among the, among the statewide candidates this year, Callaghan, ironically, is really the only one who has been contesting his opponent. I mean, mm -hmm. Faso has been little seen uh, in recent weeks. Uh, he disappeared entirely at the end of the, the Democratic primary uh, when he didn't have one. He was supposed to be raising money, but it didn't work particularly well. Uh, Janine Pirro has been, you know, Imploding, alternately, I well, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, alternately embracing this craziness that is this the, the El Piro saga and the, the investigation by the feds into her. Uh, and then when, when she was kind of done talking about that, I, I haven't heard her doing policy speeches. I mean, she's not out there talking about what she's going to do with the office. She's not out there really talking about details of Cuomo's record. I mean, she's talking, she's using sort of one-liners from a debate. Uh, but I don't hear much beyond that. I mean, she's, she's doing some retail and a lot of edit boards. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, and John Spencer, you know, I mean, has has gotten his his biggest notoriety for for mm -hmm. saying that Hillary Clinton had millions of dollars in work, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> so I uh, you know so so I would say that Callaghan, the person who has gotten who who was the the total write off supposed to be, mm -hmm. has actually been the only one, you know, for better or worse, run, running running an actual uh, campaign looking at his opponent. Let me just make a point, Bob, on something that you said because you look at both parties and and I think the problem that we're facing is the fact that we only have two parties and this is where the candidacy or possible candidacy of a uh, Mayor Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg. Now, I you know I complain about his millions, the 200 million that he spent between two races to buy City Hall. Well, I think now it's time for him to buy the presidency. I would <laughs> love for him to be able to jump. Do you know how many people he would frighten? He would frighten people who would say, oh, I can't raise that kind of money. When he says, I'm going to drop $500 million or $600 million, because that's nothing to him. It's like us taking the subway and going Especially back Especially if he sells his interest in Bloomberg. But, so, if, but so. if you don't like him as mayor, why would you like him no, as no, I do. No, no, I do like him as administrator. I found okay. it obscene for him to buy City Hall. The first time around, I understood. The second time around, as an incumbent, I found it obscene. But hey, listen, why not? The, the White House is being bought anyway. So why not sell it to one person? And, and then I think that what he tried in 2003, we all recall the nonpartisan election bid that was defeated by New York voters. I think we should reassess that. I think we should. If we can't have a third, fourth, or fifth party as an option so that we can have a real democracy in effect, not in theory. This is not a democracy. If anybody really thinks we live in a democracy, they're crazy. You got one party taking turns in Washington and everywhere else in every state legislature. This is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. 
in which you can't even select sometimes in primaries because of the way the rules are written, especially, Tom, you know the rules here. We all know the rules here in New York State in order for you to become a legitimate candidate. So this is a dictatorial democracy be run by two parties. We take turns. It'll be eight years of Republicans, eight years of Democrats, and the hell with all of you because you don't matter. Let me uh, start taking a couple of questions. Go ahead. I am uh, Jason Schaff from Brooklyn College. Uh, the Democrats seem to feel they're going to take over Congress due to anger against the Republicans over Iraq when many of them supported the war back in 2002. But also lost among all the talk about the congressional race is how low the approval of Congress as a whole is. The New York Times this past Sunday said it wasn't even at 20 percent. Is the feeling that basically all Cong that there's a, a general dislike of all congressmen and that really the Democrats won't make a difference if they take over? There's, there's a phenomenon that you usually see where uh, people will tell you in one and the same poll, they'll say, there's a problem with all school teachers or there's a problem with all congressmen. But then you ask them the next question, well, what about your congressperson? And they say, well, my guy's okay. Absolutely. You know, which, <laughs> Absolutely. Is, which is partly why you have so little turnover. But every once in a while, 1994 was a great example, and this year it looks like it's going to be another example, people really take it all the way to its logical conclusion and say, there's a problem with Congress, and if my guy um, hasn't clearly proved he's part of the solution, then he's part of the problem, and he can go too. Yep. Or, more specifically, the party in power is going to suffer from a, low a, a super low approval rating for the institution as a whole. Be because you started talking about the old Tip O'Neill dictum that all politics is local, but in fact, in 94, and I think this year, there is more of a nationalization of absolutely, the election than absolutely. we've seen in past years. You can specifically do it. I mean, that was the, the genius of Newt Gingrich that made him the Speaker of the House in 1994. They ran on national issues. There was this thing called the Contract with America. And nobody remembers what the ten planks were, but the point was a lot of people all over the country said, if you want these ten things, vote for me. If you don't want these ten things, vote for the other guy. And uh, Nancy Pelosi has done her own version of this, where what they've done is stayed on the attack. They mm -hmm. haven't talked very much mm -hmm. about what Democrats would do, other than a couple of little things like raising the minimum wage. But other than that, they've really tried to keep the focus on Bush, who had low numbers all throughout this year, on the war that's very unpopular, and said, look, if you don't like what Congress is doing, and you don't like this war, and you don't like this president, and the polls all suggested that that's where the mood of the country is, they've tried to nationalize the election and say, if that's how you feel, get rid of your local Republican. Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and campus. Alicia Da Silva, John Jay College. Um, Mr. Gerson, I definitely agree with many of the motions that you brought up tonight. But I'd like to know, how, what do you feel would be an effective um, way that we as citizens collect our um, political officials? You definitely have to participate in the electoral process. You have to register to vote, and you have to vote, in spite of what I said about both parties. I registered as an independent because I really don't believe in the party structure of either party. I, I really don't. Uh, I think that the a party, once you establish it, it perpetuates itself, it's, you know, it's, it's self-survival. And they'll do anything to stay in power. That's what we're seeing right now. Do you, can you imagine what's happening in Washington right now? What are the Republicans doing? They will sell the, their newborns, the, I mean the newborns of their children, in order to stay in power. No shame. They'll lie through their teeth. They'll say whatever it is. They'll, they'll tell you in your face. You got President Bush going in front of cameras and telling the American public that I lied to you, but this is what I really meant. He's, he's a liar. And I mean, is there any other word for it? And then you have it at the local level. And what I'm saying to you is if you really want to, you have to register, you have to vote. Don't vote for the incumbent. Don't vote for the incumbent. Throw them all out. Vote for somebody else. There are people that are trying to get into the system not allowed through party rules, through uh, the way that you have to pay your dues still, through the, some semblance of what party bosses were. Vote for a person that you get to know and start with the city council level. Even if, uh, it's not this year, but look at that. Don't vote for any other people unless, for example, I've made a choice. One person, one Democrat I'm going to vote for. Everybody else can go to hell. They're not getting my vote. Person, one of, one of the reasons that people register as Democrat in New York, people like myself, is so that the real election often takes place in the primary. 
And if you're not a registered Democrat, exactly. and I'm sure that you wanted to vote in some of those primaries. I wanted to vote against Hillary. I really did. I <laughs> really a, did. But, and I almost switched it, but it's illegal to do or that. In, or in mayoral primaries like last year or in 2001, you certainly would have wanted to cast a vote in those primaries, right? Absolutely. But, but I can't get myself in good conscience just to vote and register in a party and give them some more power. Right now, what's the registration rate? It's still 5 to 1, or is it 4 to 1 right now in terms of Democrats? Has it made a difference? We've elected Rudy Giuliani, not to one, twice. We elected another, not just a Republican, a multi-billion dollar Republican. I mean, He's that's... not much of a Republican. And that's, so that's, yeah. that's 16 years. What do we do in Albany? We elected a Republican, not once, twice, three times. I mean, so does it really make sense, Tom? I understand your point. But I say that you have to be able to confuse them. And by the way, the worst culprit in this, in all of this, I think it's, they should be arrested on site, are pollsters. Do me a favor. If you ever, I don't know, has anybody ever given me a call for a pollster? Anybody at home? Yeah. You have? Okay, lie to them next time. Confuse the <laughs> hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name is Brian Marr from Brooklyn College, and uh, I'd like to know if uh, the Republicans' unpopularity is the cause of the Democrats possibly sweeping. What happens if the Democrats are equally unpopular? Is that going to grow the independent party uh, as it is going out west, as it's growing? Is that going to be uh, implied now in the upcoming elections? Are there going to be independent parties, people going to independent parties being elected? And will that reach the presidential level? And is it a good thing if that happens? Well, I, think, I, think you, I think you have independents. You have people like Harrison who just don't register with a party. But I think, and, and that's a growing number, by the way, from coast to coast. But there's, there's an interesting uh, sort of uh, middle group and we used to call them Reagan Democrats, you know, Democrats who were blue collar in, in a lot of cases, who didn't have a problem with voting for Reagan. They had the same sort of conservative values. They liked social some of what issues he, and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, social issues, but even on defense, they liked what he had mm -hmm. to say. Um, you also have liberal Republicans. They do exist. You have pro-choice Republicans who are out there. They don't toe the party line on abortion. They don't toe the party line on, on gays. They, you know, maybe gay marriage, you might be pushing it a little bit. But um, that's the... Uh, that's the, the, the rich terrain uh, of, of American politics. I mean, in, in the swing states that we've all heard so much about, it's, they tend to be in the suburbs, these folks. Mm -hmm. the, you know, that's who everybody yeah. wants, the suburbs of Philadelphia, the suburbs of Cleveland, the suburbs of New York. That's where, in state after state, you're seeing races decided. And it's people who, I mean, one, one uh, pundit has called them office park workers. People who sort of go out and just grind it out in these modern, you know, white-collar factories whose lives aren't necessarily getting better, who are having a hard time paying their mortgages, and they don't really care about party label because they themselves go to this office park every day and they're right. judging on performance. Yeah, and but the, right. the theory is that they're putting some of those same standards on their political right. choices. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I want to make just sort of an adjunct point that doesn't directly address the question, but it's actually something that, that Errol said. In raising certainly Mike Bloomberg is who I keep thinking of in terms of this great independence run who, that we keep potentially hearing about for 2008, where the logic is both parties are a mess and I'm going to clean it up. But it's certainly what Joe Lieberman is running on, um, even though Joe Lieberman also keeps saying at the same time, I'll caucus with Democrats. Not, right, um, not by choice. So <laughs> right, um, so right. No, he's he's running because he has to. Uh, so and and so he's running sort of with a foot in each side. Um, I. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, while there doesn't necessarily need to be slavish devotion to party labels, and I do think people are getting very tired of it. I do. I mean, I think that I think that what constitutes ideology seems to be shifting. And for instance, when I went to South Carolina a couple of months ago to watch Giuliani speak, um, the level of of bile about John McCain from conservative Republicans there was striking, and it all harkens back to the 2000 presidential race. But they don't see it, they, and it's, it's completely irrational. I hate him. He is more liberal than the Democrats. He's more of a Democrat than Hillary Clinton, which immediately begged the question, how about Rudy Giuliani, who is pro-choice, pro-gun control? Oh, you know, I don't think those are the big issues that are, you know, going to mess. So, you know, it's you can it's really terror, and I think he's really good on terror. So uh, people can rationalize any way they want. I, I think what what someone like Mike Bloomberg, who has often talked about 
you know, nonpartisan elections and, and running as an independent potentially for 2008, although he, he continues to sort of I don't believe it. he's running. He's been uh, very clear. Who? Well, oh, Rudy? Um, Bloomberg. Mike. Oh, Bloomberg. It, it, he's been very clear, but and yet he's, his top deputy keeps talk, talking in front page stories and about it. And he doesn't so, shut On the up, record, yes. Right? And he doesn't, so it's, he doesn't I, rein him in. To me, right. that you, you have to be accountable. If one of Hillary Clinton's top aides went out and did something like that, I really think we'd hold her accountable. So I don't see why this is sort of different. But Mike Bloomberg often talks about how he is a political and Mike Bloomberg is not apolitical. Um, Mike Bloomberg not, might not be partisan, mm. but there is no one who is apolitical in politics. And so um, the, the, the notion cool. that that exists is something that I would like to just kind of step back from for I, a I, second. Listen, let me just say this. Before, I know there's people have questions. I would just like to see, don't get me wrong, I, I really believe in the voting system. I think we have a right and we have a power. I would just like to see one party get up, one candidate, and say two things. Pick health insurance coverage for everyone. I'm going to run on that. If I run for the presidency, my party's just going to deal with this. Let's deal with that alone. Health coverage for everyone. Give me that one deal. I'll go, I'll go even volunteer for that person. But we don't have that. So allegedly we, we care about all these things, the death penalty, you know, whether gay should get married or not, whether you have, I mean, it's insane. Solve problems that you can solve. Health insurance coverage for everyone. How about tuition? The problem we have for college is that everybody has a right to go to college if they want. Damn it, Cuba does it. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Is, is, it, that, is it that complicated? I don't want, I'm, listen, I'm sick and tired from the right and the left, the morality that we don't have or that we lack. The nation is in a moral collapse. There is no morality, as I define it. And I'm not talking about issues whether, you know, the, these people molesting children or these cheating on their wives or wives cheating. Who cares about that? That's going to go on. It's, it's, it's gone on from the beginning of time. Who cares about help. molesting children? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, no, well, I, look, quite frankly, quite frankly, we have a problem that could be solved by the criminal justice system. It isn't a political matter. No, all of a sudden, you know, Congressman Fole becomes a political problem and it becomes fodder for all these things that we're concerned about allegedly. But there's a criminal justice system. He could be put in, I mean, there is prosecution. But what about the people that are not getting any health care? I mean, I worry about stuff like that. And people don't seem to care. And we get distracted by all these other issues. Let me uh, go to another question, please. Uh, my name is Victor Cruz, and I'm from Hunter College. Uh, assuming that Nancy Pelosi becomes Speaker of the House, if you listen to some conservatives, it's Armageddon. If you listen to some liberals, it's exactly what we need for the country. Uh, in your opinion, what's the pros and cons of Nancy Pelosi becoming Speaker of the House? And if and is there a different demand being Speaker than being a Congresswoman from San Francisco? Mm. <laughs> you answer that one. Yes, 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 that question. You know, so uh, when, when you have to build consensus, um, which she would have to do in a party that you know, the, you know, the, the Democratic Party is a fairly broad ideological spectrum. I mean, my guess, I mean, my guess is um, some of the the people who have been painted as conservatives' worst nightmare, somebody like a. Um, uh, a Maxine Waters, or somebody like a Charlie Rangel chairing Ways and Means, or you know somebody like John Conyers I'm from Michigan. Hope so, right. John Conyers, yeah. I think, gets you know justice or something right. like that. Um, mm. My guess, because I've met and followed some of these folks in some cases for decades, is that they're going to be responsible. I mean, they're not wild-eyed, crazy people. You don't get wild-eyed, crazy, genuine radicals, you know, well, making think, a career in Congress. Well, it just that, doesn't happen. I think that the Republicans did. I mean, I think there was a real radical tinge. To what's to what's well, going be, on in the last I mean, the last twelve years? Look, some of it may be ideologically driven. I mean, some of the some of or the, even or evangelically driven. Some of the <laughs> some some of the issues such as tort reform that the president was pushing, you mm -hmm. know, making it harder to get a big cash recovery if you're injured by a hospital or or, or anybody else uh, or a corporation. Um, that's not going to happen. I mean, under the Democrats, allegedly. I think you'll see those kind of changes, and that will drive some people crazy. But is the republic going to stop functioning? Are the institutions going to grind to a halt? I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, I think the question does raise this, this point, which is that these midterm elections will set the stage for what happens in the next presidential election. And if Nancy yes. Pelosi is the speaker and she doesn't come in with an effective agenda for the first 100 days or for the first few months, 
uh, the, the Republicans are going to be able to point the finger very cleverly, and they will very effectively write back. If all the Democrats do, and, quickly, and I won't mind if they do hold a whole lot of hearings about how Iraq happens and other things, but if that's all they do, and they don't focus on like the issues Hurston is talking about in terms of health care or something that has a, a bottom line effect to the electorate, I think they may be out of luck and they may be losing an opportunity. But if you go back 12 years, I mean, Bill Clinton, in his first two years in office, the health care fiasco they tried they came up with this basically Rube Goldberg system that nobody understood it mm -hmm. was it was the greatest focus of effort in creating a national health plan and it just foundered in 1994 the Republicans take Congress and I believe that Clinton was a very successful president because he stopped the worst of what the Republicans wanted to do mm -hmm. that Clinton almost hit that his reputation is almost because he had a Republican. My he point, knew how to work yeah, that Republican. No, my point Congress. exactly. I think that I think that George W. Bush could see his fortunes improve mm -hmm. with a bad Democratic, ineffective Democratic Congress. There's no oh. question about that. Or a Democratic Congress that goes beyond where its uh, mandate per per permits it at this point, which is what happened in '94. I think Nancy Pelosi is really the kind of candidate that they want to see the Democrats. Will they allow themselves for her to function? jeopardizing the 2008 election presidency. I don't know. I'm just saying <coughs> she looks like the, her, certainly her history is one of being a liberal person, very outspoken, but there are certain things, protocols that you have to follow. Will she be able to function in that? And I think you make an excellent point. If she is effective, then what happens to Hillary's candidacy? Because they're going to, I mean, they're going to knock heads. I mean, you can't get a straight answer from Hillary on the war, for example. Is she for it, against it? I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's worse than John Kerry in 2004. So you can't really get it straight. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Katiana Mo from York College. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Uh, Gerso, uh, about... Borrero. Uh, Borrero. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, what, can, what can we do as to raise uh, a, a better public awareness as to how we go about electing our official or elected officials since the power to vote is not really working because we have parties that promise stuff and we don't really see them happening and they try to go back into office and they get elected again. So what can we really do as the audience and the voters to... Well, you certainly cannot depend on the news media. Uh, I, as a columnist, I wrote, I'm writing about Alan Hevesy and all the problems and I'm taking it from the point, you know, the, the English language is it's excellent. He says that I, I, I committed an error. Well, if you look at the definition of error in any dictionary, and I looked at the Spanish version of it, I went to the Academia to find out what error means. I mean, you commit an error when you do something and it's not intentional. He intended to, def to, 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 to pick our pockets. I, I think that what you have to, what you're saying is really impossible. It's, it's the person. You as a, as, as a voter, as a student, in the household to be able to speak. Look, I have a nine-year-old. He's going to be nine-year-old. And I have a 23-year-old. Uh, the 23-year-old swears, and, you know, she's a liberal. She swears by, 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 uh, by Hillary Rodham Clinton. She volunteered. Well, she was at Hunter College, by the way. She graduated from Hunter College Political Science. But I have a nine-year-old almost. Uh, I wrote a column about it. He saw Bush one day, and he called him a liar on the tube. <laughs> So I said, there's hope in this household. There's something here that's happening. I think, and, the, and we talk politics. We sit down. We, we don't have dinner every day together, uh, especially when you have to do, you know, your work and all that. But you must talk about this amongst yourself, amongst your family. You have to read. You know, there's a basic document that I made reference to. Read the Constitution. It's 4,400 words, 40 words, I think it is. For, for, I forget that. I know I've read it a few times. And recently, you just go and read it and start thinking about what you're seeing going around you. I mean, it may be, you know, maybe I'm idealistic. It may be emotional on my part. Maybe I'm going, you know, my, my wife tells me that as I get older, I become crazier and more liberal and more. I don't think I'm a liberal. I, I'm just sick of this nonsense, this partisan stuff that goes on while people die. Can you look at, you mentioned Katrina at the beginning, the sea, uh, there was it corruption, Katrina and casualties. And, and casu I mean, look at that. How can we allow a city like... Do you steal like... that in your column? No, no not no. yet. No. Uh, but, but how can you allow this? How can, I mean, it's basic things. Latch on to things. If, if we allow for something like that to happen, with and how much money has poured into New Orleans? And it's been stolen. We have thieves. Thieves are running the government. I mean, I'll tell you, just to add on to that, we have what I call a complaint-driven system. You know, there are a lot of parts of government the 911 system is probably the most obvious. Nobody comes until you pick up the phone and say, I have an emergency, I need something fixed. 
it's really true throughout the government. And I think if you read closely, not only the Constitution, but the federal codes, the state laws, and so forth and so on, everything starts with a complaint from the public. You know, every, everything of significance. If you want to move stuff, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta move it. And, you know, I mean, squeaky and, and wheel. Squeaky mm -hmm. wheel, and and you you so you soon find out that if you squeak with your neighbors and you all do it together, you have a much better chance of getting something out of city government than not. And and on and on and on it goes. I mean. There's no substitute for activism. The, the reason I refer to the Constitution is because it's the only thing that we have that's tangible that hasn't been altered. It's kind of hard for them to, you know, to really screw around with that. Everything else is rules by day, you know. But you, you weren't you weren't telling people not to read newspapers, were you? No, 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 no. no, no. I'm saying that. We, no, I, I'll clean I'll clean that up for the sake of the New York Post, the Village Voice, the Daily News, and El and El Diario. The fact is that what I'm saying is we're preoccupied. I mean, I was editor in chief for the paper for 41 months, and believe me, what editors do is crazy, and what we sign and what we get covered sometimes we hit it sometimes we don't we're following things that we shouldn't be following and you know because it's sexy or it's popular or putting on the front page what an idiot says about you know whether she spent a million dollars I mean who cares about stuff like that but it's front page of the daily news it's important do you understand what I'm saying was that really important to all of you it was a great front page by the way great story and Ben Smith was great in snatching that crazy Bastard. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, he's crazy. John, this guy shouldn't be allowed in public. Never mind running for office. <laughs> We're running out of time. Let me get uh, one more question. Hello, in. Uh, my name is Denise Nolasco from Brew College. I've seen that various, you, uh, various of you have uh, mentioned that there is a clear distinction between politics and policy. What is that distinction, and what is your responsibility as journalists to make the public aware of, of the differences? Good question. That's a very, very good, good question. That's a very good question. I, 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 See if I, they answer it. Well, go ahead. <laughs> I think of it is, and I, I heard this said once, and it, it, it stuck with me for a long time. The first duty as a politician, the first duty of any political leader, is to get themselves and their party reelected. So that, that involves doing and saying certain things. Policy is an entirely different kind of a thing. Policy is how should we run the republic, and that's not supposed to be just for your party or for your followers, but for the republic as a whole. And so it, she, she put her finger on exactly what the problem is. You've got what's the common good, and then what's the political good? What will get me reelected? What will get my party reelected? What will strengthen my majority? As opposed to what's right, you know, should we be loading debt onto our kids? Should we be sending kids off to war? totally different kind of a question. The, the job of a, of a journalist is to help uh, explain the difference between the two. And all too often, we go to the horse race. We go to the politics. Who's up, right. who's down, who's ahead in the polls, as opposed to how do we get universal health care? How many people are living in poverty? When is the city of New Orleans going to get rebuilt? And, and um, more important questions. Yeah, we, we don't, we, we don't I, I, certainly not in New York races, we don't spend a, a tremendous amount of time covering the, the, the policy points of the candidates. And the candidates have all started tailoring their behavior accordingly, as I was mentioning before about Piero and Cuomo. I mean, I, I think Jane Piero has had something like 10 press conferences since this investigation became public uh, into her uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I think she's had uh, zero on, on policy. The one she was going to have about death penalty at ground zero, she ended but, up canceling uh, because of this Jeffrey Deskovich case. Yet, um, right, but yet policy too often, this is, you know, in my opinion, both as a political guy now and as a former journalist, uh, is played out in the demonization of groups, of immigrants, um, of gays. Um, and, you know, in the case of gays, I think it's largely a Republican sin. In the case of immigrants, I think both parties demonize you know, uh, demonize immigrants to a to a degree, and to what degree does policy descend into a into a demonization, which is exactly the kind of divided, you know, if 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 you're trying to put together fifty percent plus one, because the country is profoundly divided, maybe not in New York State, where you know we're totally out of touch with the rest of the country, thank God, but you know, in terms of nationally, the country is split right down the middle. And as and, it relates to journalism, though, what do you think we should be doing different? Which was the question. Well, I'm right, but I, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, I've worked at um, a number of different papers, some of which allowed us to do policy, some of which, you know, you know one of which uh, somebody said we would do these long series that were only read by the reporter's parents and the target's lawyers, <laughs> but that they were still important policy analyses. Sure. Um, and then, you know, I worked at papers where it was a little bit more of a, you know, tabloid culture. 
Um, so, I mean, but, you know, so, you know, sometimes you have to, as a reporter, you have to kind of trick the policy into the yes. into the story. You have to almost to play your own editors. Well, you, have to, you have to certainly have to fight with your editors from time to time to, to get stuff in that you think is important. But that's a very old school attitude, by the way. I mean, yes. with the, the, the rise of the bloggers and the rise of the Internet, the notion say. is that people can pick whatever they want yep. and all information is on an equal plane and you don't have any particular expertise. I'm old school. I don't believe that. I spent decades of my life studying and, and getting to know how to interview people. I've dug into stuff. I know a lot of a, a lot of stuff that I think the public should want to know, which is why I'm a columnist. And I just try and tell people, it's like, look, I've looked into this. I think that this is something you need to know. I don't think that that is going to go out of style anytime soon. If it does, God help us as a republic. There, there did used to be two different styles with, with you know, and as you know, and this is this has really changed. I think with the advent of the blogs, uh, for the reason Errol said, it used to be when this was a, you know, a, a couple of dailies town, a few dailies newspaper, daily newspapers. There were the tabloids, where you would get the sexy stuff, you would get the poli purely political stuff uh, from the New York Times and the broadsheets, uh, and places like Newsday. You would be able to read lengthy uh, exposés about candidates' policy positions and where they stood, and, and people were able to refer to those. And now, because of the way media is trending, mm -hmm. everybody's kind of doing the same thing, and, and it is far but less heavy on the policy. But that's exactly why an educated New Yorker is has the huge benefit of having four dailies Absolutely. if you count Newsday, five dailies Indeed. if you count The Sun, six if you count El Diario, don't listen to this, seven if you count OI. Um, there's countless Chinese language papers that, you know, I agree. dailies. There's, you know, there is a wide variety and you should be reading. And people who complain about the New York Post being too conservative, you use your own filter, which is not the case in terms of the reporters, by the way, but maybe in terms of the editorial page. Though with Rupert Murdoch's dalliance with Hillary Clinton, who knows where that's going? Just careful there. Um, <laughs> I'm not the one who works. At that no, just, uh, so I mean, you know, but you I have know. to read more than one paper. That's you are. I mean, think of. I always argue. I used to teach at the Columbia Journalism School that a political reporter, in particular, has a lot of power to set an agenda, and what you see is important comes through your own filter of your own experience and your own values, and you should be scared about that because nobody elects you, but. You have, if you, and it's much worse in most towns in this country, which are one newspaper towns. You're lucky in New York City having four, five, six, seven, however many dailies and however many TV stations and however many everything else. Take advantage of it and filter what you read through your own life, through your own life experience. Mm -hmm. We have about 30 seconds left. Um, are the Democrats going to take, I'm going to ask a quick yes or no question, are the Democrats going to take the House and the Senate? Who knows? Who cares? Are the Democrats going to take the House and the Senate? Maybe. Okay, is that, but the Democrats going to take the House and the Senate? I'm Democrats not will win, will win the House, they will not win the Senate. I, along with it. House, yes, Senate, no. And uh, will Bob Menendez of New Jersey be the decider? Will, will he win or lose? He'll lose. Good. He'll lose right. and he'll be indicted. <laughs> That's the extra credit question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do really want to, uh, we're, um, we're about out of time. I want to thank you all for a very spirited discussion. We'll see you next time on the CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thank you.